Hi, good morning and welcome to GitHub Galaxy. Maybe this is your first session of the day or your third, but we are so excited to have you here today. My name is Brittany O'Shea and I am our Director of Security PMM here and we are joined by a wonderful group of hosts and panelists today. But before I get into that and we get to meet some of the exciting faces on this call, we've opened some polls. We wanna make sure this content is tailored to you. So drop in your feedback there. If you have any questions or you'd like to ask anything, uh, please use the Q&A tab right up in the right-hand corner. If anything comes up and you're having issues from a viewing perspective, we recommend using Chrome. And um, if you have any troubles, there's also some docs or there's a chat moderator that we can ask questions to. So please let us know. We wanna make sure you have the best viewing experience today. And without further ado, I will pass it over to Keith, who's going to get us introduced to our panelists. Thanks so much, Brittany. Hi, folks. I'm Keith Hoodlett. I'm a principal field security specialist here at GitHub. And we have an incredible lineup of leaders here to share their perspectives and experiences around securing development systems while optimizing for productivity. Without further ado, I'd like to invite the panel to introduce themselves. Let's start with Tyler. Hey, thanks, Keith. Thank, uh, so I'm Tyler Miles. I work for Liberty Mutual as a product owner, and I work on a team called Software Delivery. So we're responsible for helping engineers take their ideas uh, and deliver them ultimately through the pipeline out to the cloud. So that's me. I've been there 17 years. It means I'm getting pretty old, and uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Tyler. And uh, as an icebreaker question, for learning new things, do you prefer books, blogs, podcasts, YouTube, or maybe even TikTok? Uh, definitely not cool enough for TikTok. Um, so I tend to gravitate to podcasts. I like YouTube a lot, and I do some reading as well, uh, usually before bedtime. So I'm only good for about five pages before I conk out for the night. So, yeah. I love it. I love it. Lucia, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Keith. Well, I, I'm Lucia. I'm from Argentina. Uh, I'm currently working at Mercado Libre, which is the biggest e-commerce here in Latin America. Uh, uh, I hope our folks there on Brazil knows Mercado Libre and use it too. Uh, I work for the application security team uh, since the last uh, for the last five years, so I'm quite into application security right now. Uh, and I'm the technical leader for the uh, Blue Team application security team. Awesome, and Thank it's you. so exciting to have you here. Uh, Lucia, quick icebreaker question for you. Since you work with code uh, on a regular basis as well as configurations, do you prefer tabs, spaces, or tabs as spaces? Okay, In really important question, Gil. Thank you. Uh, well. I, most of my projects are written in Go, in Golang, so I have no choice because uh, Go standards kind of forces you to use tabs. But I actually prefer that, so I, I'm quite good with that, with that choice. Awesome, awesome. And Vijay, please introduce yourself. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And uh, thank you, Brittany and uh, Keith, for the warm introductions and, uh, and a big welcome to my fellow speakers here, Tyler and Lucia. Great to have you. Uh, as part of this uh, panel. Uh, my name is Vijay Thuma. I am uh, in an executive role uh, with uh, for DevSecOps at JM Family. Uh, so primarily responsible for building an enterprise competency around the DevSecOps, meaning bringing the developer community together, bringing our infosec team, bringing our enterprise architectures, bringing our technology operations so that we can drive towards um, and accelerating our uh, developer experience end-to-end, -end, right, and creating that uh, uh, seamless experience for them. Love it, love it. Um, so Brittany, I'll pass it back over to you for our first set of questions. Perfect, it's exciting what a wide range of panelists and attendees we have today. And, and looking at the pool, I'm excited to see we're all in the right place. We're seeing some things surfaced about difficulty to get our security tools in the developer workflow, challenges with compliance, and just overall wanting an edge on how we fix findings. So we're gonna get to that. But the one thing that unites us all is we all, no matter industry or place, our software companies at the heart of what we do. We have to use software to get an edge and get value to customers more easily. So we're gonna talk a lot today about how we 
balance the security of software with developer productivity and the ability just to get value to our end users quicker. So we're going to start with VJ. VJ, we'd love to hear your perspective on what you would say your top challenges with securing your organization software have been and how you've overcome those. Yeah, you know, thank, thanks, Brittany, for that question. So um, it's an interesting question. I'll take a step back here to talk about the need to drive that st uh, strategic risk and the need to build more efficient and effective security into the software. Right? Any software can introduce vulnerabilities into into the, the entire you know DevSecOps lifecycle. Just like any other organizations, you know, our top priority at JM Family is to integrate security into the software development life cycle. So understanding the threats that can emerge across the entire software supply chain is critical. So in my role as a cloud engineering leader, um, you know, it is to enhance the developer experience, you know, coming up with a DevSec um, DevSecOps strategy to consolidate, standardize, and optimize the workflows, the processes, work environments to simplify, reduce friction, and support that speed to value is to, you know, in itself is challenging, right? So, so when it comes to those top challenges, you know, you know, just like any other organizations, we do have a landscape, you know, with different levels of integration, interoperability, and the need to make contextualized, you know, enforcement decisions fast enough to meet our business needs. Fundamentally, you know, requiring us to, you know, build those foundational security techniques and processes. So um, we are, are, you know, we're moving towards cloud native applications. So we use a multitude of open source and third party components, lots of dependencies, right? So we need to be cognizant of, you know, software composition analysis, SAS, SAS, so and so tools, right? So, well, in our case, JM family, as we are moving towards build everything cloud native, uh, vulnerabilities are only one part of it, right? There could be other vectors such as mis misconfigured CI CD pipelines, secure informational, you know, unintentionally committed to source code repos, API management. So, using that security automation and orchestration in a way that can be, you know, they, that they can perform well defined repetitive tasks. Um, you know, otherwise, which otherwise may be, you know, prone to human error. So I would say, you know, um, don't automate for the sake of automation, right? Make sure security, you know, remains consistent and up to date with the development pipelines by automating and, you know, codification of security. Uh, endpoint security, you know, to provide the data security as threat protection. Um, um, you know, don't implement a mix of defective and preventive controls as well. They don't, they don't do it, but it's something that we, we you know, we have to invest in. And then, Enforcing zero trust, right? It's been it's been a challenge, right? I mean, every step of software where application configuration, components of open source is always challenging because there's there it is a strategy that needs to be baked into the framework, you know, not a service. So I mean I can it's it's kind of that, you know, those are the top challenges we have. Um, and I can talk about, you know, how we have come to the over challenge, but I'd like to, you know, uh, hear from you know other speakers as to what they're experiencing. Yeah, VJ, I mean, everything you're saying there definitely resonates with me. I think Liberty Mutual is an interesting uh, part of their journey. We're coming from a place where we've got a, a bunch of redundancy across a kind of very federated global platform. Um, you know, duplicative tools to support an international engineering community. And so a big part of what we're after out of the gate here is this idea of a, a one global software delivery platform. So, you know, that's certainly one foundational component of what we're chasing. But the other aspect here is the fact that from a security perspective, we very much left application engineering teams to their own devices. Um, so there's, you know, security is a little bit ambigu ambiguous right now. Teams are left to solve for it on their own in a lot of cases. And so we're really looking to reevaluate you know, how we're thinking about security within that global software delivery platform bringing it left, um, getting rid of duplicative tooling as much as possible, and uh, you know, just trying to make it easier for engineers so they don't have to go out there and try to figure this stuff out for themselves to provide the patterns and things like that to identify security across that software, software supply chain and um, you know, bring some efficiencies in that developer experience as a result. Yep, we're hearing a few key trends here as far as automation and streamlining approaches. Lucia, from your experience, is that what you're seeing as your challenges and solutions as well? Or do you have a different perspective? No, I totally agree with BJ and Tyler. I think that another challenge that maybe it's not something that happens to every company, uh, but it's the scale. 
Uh, so many languages, many applications, many developers, multiple clouds. Uh, Mercado Libre is built in Java, JavaScript, Go, Ruby, C, C++, Python, Golan, etc. And we're almost 15,000 developers working on almost 30,000 repositories. So the scale and the different environments represent big challenges for, for security. Uh, my team, the, the security application team, focuses, as Vijay said before, on securing the development lifecycle, you know, and each of the stages represents a different and completely different security approach, security strategy. Uh, for example, um, the development stage, the continuous integration pipeline running in each uh, pull request, uh, has two, secure, two different security steps, one focusing on vulnerable dependencies, because it's part of our securing uh, supply chain strategy, and another one with well, vulnerability analysis with GitHub and security, of course. Uh, so I think it's key to have a security presence in each of these stages, uh, because there is not a silver bullet, magic tool, effortless solution. Security must be taken into account in every step. Nowadays, I think it's well known that a web application firewall does not solve all of our problems. A backbunty program does not solve our problems. Uh, I don't know, uh, frequently penetration testing does not solve all of our problems. So I think that complementary security strategies are key solutions for security. And I think that scales kind of forces you, like a big scale kind of forces you to do that. Yeah, and, and Brittany, I mean, just adding to that, right? Um, I think you know, it's important to select the right tool. Right? So what I've done is, you know, selecting GitHub Advanced Security as our CI/CD tool that can provide code scanning, secret scanning, dependency reviews, right, to drive that modern, secure, developed-focused security and compliance. So, um, you know, when it comes to GitHub Advanced Security, it's a fully integrated, um, you know, DevSecOps platform that just goes beyond just the CI/CD, right? As an example, Dependabot. Uh, finds and repairs vulnerable dependencies. Code scanning detects flaws in the new code, you know, during development. SAML, SSO, LDAP integrations, right? Secret scanning that can prevent accidental leakage of security tokens. So I'm in the early stages of creating awareness and desire within the delivery teams where DevOps engineers should be intentional about the broad categories of threats to watch out for and the tools and processes such as version control, multi-factor authentication, automated security scanning that are effective not only just from preventing but also identifying attacks at each stage of the you know, software supply chain, right? That's why, you know, assembling a, a, a complete DevSecOps strategy that governs how to code applications, infrastructure, um, you know, and uh, protected access across the software is very important, you know, which is where I have, been, you know, I'm investing my, you know, early, you know, time within the chain family. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's so important when we think about the challenges that come from working in distributed environments with varying levels of cybersecurity awareness across the company is how do you create that uh, consistency and how do you create that easy on-ramp for anyone that needs to come and engage and wants to focus on first developing their software, but also we want to do it securely. Tyler and Lucia, you've kind of touched on the scale of your organizations and how you do that, but any tips for someone who's struggling with that distribution and challenge of security awareness that you've used in your own organization? Yeah, I think communication is hard. I, Lucia, you did a great job articulating the scale of your org and you know, we're very similar. We've got 8,000 developers, 50,000 repositories. And so reaching everyone is really hard and we continue to try to build experiences around doing that. I'd say ultimately it, it's required some hustle, you know, from our perspective. So we're attending every kind of architectural round table, you know, lunch and learn, demo sessions and doing that again and again and a big part of what we're after here is ultimately to build a culture you know a culture and a community focused around security right and so you know we think we can do that through a number of different you know communication vehicles blog posts um you know sessions where we're trying to gamify security a little bit and bring that community together and really build it from the ground up so not saying we've got it all figured out yet. We're still very much a work in progress, but uh, you know we're well on our way. Absolutely, yes, communication is key. 
yeah, it, it's quite difficult to, we had here in Mercado Libre, we have like a whole team focuses on awareness and security awareness. Um, it's kind of difficult because you have to work on how people learn and how people uh, really stuck things in, in their heads. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with Tyler. I, I think the awareness and different kind of communication, as it says, like we also have like a, like a game, like a communication security uh, week where developers can uh, try to attack our own platform and stuff. Um, but I think uh, on the part of infrastructure and architecture, the the uh, the way we address this in Mercado Libre is kind of different. We have like secure default policies. Like we try to um, make things secure by default. It's nothing so new. Uh, we try to not keep everything to developers about you know infrastructure uh, architecture the way they code or maybe the way the, the, the kind of dependency so normal typical solutions for things like i don't know a web framework uh, how to do queries to the database a uh, rest client whatever so there's other teams here in Magali, you know the security team that focuses on that you know to give solutions that they uh, will later uh, support you. Yeah, absolutely. So as we close on this topic, we're going to have Keith kick off everyone's favorite topic. But while he does that and starts talking about compliance, we're going to pick up another poll. Love the engagement there. So thank you for sharing your insights. Sure. And really quick as well, I just wanted to briefly share the results from the previous poll that we ran because I thought that it really highlighted the challenge that you're all speaking to, which is um, around the fact of just like integrating security, communicating with development teams across that process. Like you've all spoken almost directly to this experience of, you know, that that difficulty or that that thought process that goes into working with developers, right? Communication and making sure that they know what's going on. They understand the challenges. They understand that feedback. Now, of course, we have other votes as well. I mean, each one of these is over 10% in terms of the, the you know, feedback as well. So um, great things to consider as we continue to, to move forward. Now, as Brittany brought up, compliance is one of those things that many of us uh, have to address, especially as you get to very large organizations, uh, some of which are international, but even those that are localized within a specific region. So as compliance standards have evolved dramatically in recent years, shifting away from the check the box standards to objective based policies. Uh, you know, this has significantly affected many organizations' approaches to security. So maybe starting with Tyler, you know, given that uh, you work in an organization that does insurance and, and works in that sort of financial sector in some sp uh, respect, what regulatory requirements does your company adhere to, and how does GitHub Advanced Security help you accomplish this? Yeah, aren't I lucky? I get to be the uh, leadoff hitter to talk about compliance stuff. So I'm sure <laughs> I'm trying not to put everyone to sleep. Here, but yeah, I mean, you know, as part of selling insurance, right? It's a highly regulated industry, um, and so if we want to continue to sell insurance, then we have to, you know, do fun things like get audited and pass those audits, right? And I think traditionally, a lot of that has been painful. Um, you know, you talk to an engineer in Liberty Mutual, you talk to the compliance team at Liberty Mutual, and it's a lot of work to go through an audit to produce the artifact facts to attest to some of the, the compliance and regulatory demands that we have as a company. Um, you know, certainly things like segregation of duty, um, things like change control, things like having full traceability through that entire software supply chain so that you can go from the point of an originating, you know, artifacts, you know, someone requesting work all the way through the change itself, change artifacts and things like that, and being able to attest that you know, all the boxes were checked and the things that needed to happen happened from an audit perspective. And again, all of that traditionally happens very downstream, you know, sometimes significantly after the change itself was even made, you know, like people will come and be like, you know, hey, uh, you know, you know, this change is being audited and a lot of people are scratching their heads trying to remember, you know, what even it was in the first place. And so what we're trying to do is how do we bring some of that attestation and, and compliance earlier into the developer workflow, into that engineering lifecycle, right? So if there's things that we can attest to 
um, during a commit check, for example, or um, you know, throughout the build process, for example, whether that be a security scan or you know, some sort of OPA uh, type of validation. Those are the things we're really focused on right now, you know, both to ensure the compliance of our applications and the work we do, but also to streamline the engineering and compliance process itself so that it's not as painful as it has been in the past. So again, you know, I talk about all this stuff like we've got it totally figured out. We do not, um, but we definitely see a lot of opportunity for improvement. And I think one of the areas where GitHub and GitHub Advanced Security has helped us a lot is first off we're all kind of using it right so trying to get away from the federation and a bunch of the redundant tools and things like that that we had historically so everyone's using common tooling which is huge and then the observability then that we can get out of that right because a lot of the compliance questions and some of the things that go into compliance they have to do with observability and visibility into the platform to be able to attest to some of those regulations and so with everything in one spot, and then some of the observability and visibility that GitHub and GitHub Advanced Security can provide, we're starting to see some real progress made towards making this easier. Um, and uh, and that's huge. We have a lot of work to do again in terms of continuing to shift this left and getting some of that feedback in front of the engineers earlier in the process. But um, you know, I feel encouraged about you know where we're going and some of the capabilities we have at our disposal. You know, it's really interesting as well, just uh, looking at the poll results here, it seems like our audience feels a lot of this pain as well, right? Like number of audits passed or compliance <laughs> standards met, like a, a, a large portion, you know, like if we split these three things uh, that sort of lead this off with defects identified, mean time to remediate and audits or compliance standards met, it sounds like you're trying yeah. to accomplish pretty much all three in some ways, right? It's like, you're trying to make sure that the things that you're doing from like a detection and a meantime to remediate are helping you uh, have that information in a useful way so that you can pass audits um, is, is the approach you're taking. Yeah. Is that maybe a good summary of, of what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I think so. I guess, you know, I kind of look at this, I guess misery loves company. Um, so <laughs> I'm not alone, but yeah, I mean, again, I, I can't stress it enough with all of this stuff. I think it really starts with having good data, good observability, right? And then through that, you can start to build efficiencies and, you know, improving the experience and things like that based on, you know, not only an understanding of where those opportunities are through that data, but just the data itself is really going to lend itself to being able to make some real tangible progress. So yeah, in my mind, it, it really, it's like an observability first, have the data. And if, if your stuff is converged and consolidated in a common platform um, and you've got some common tooling that sits on top of that from a scanning perspective and a validation perspective, it really starts to make some of that easier. So. I love it. I love it. And and maybe moving over to VJ, like I'd love to get your take on this as well. Like how are you baking mm -hmm. security into the development process there? Yeah. You know, kind of, uh, kind of uh, Tyler touched upon, you know, what's important from a tooling perspective, right? I think, you know, um, you know, Keith, the way I look at it is security practices, right. needs to be baked. Uh, through the development life cycle, you know, through people, processes, and technology. It's just not about tooling, right? So baking those with people means not just getting, having people who can advocate for security, right? But educating teams about the time and effort that it takes to fix a security flaw early in the process, you know, is much lower than doing it in the uh, later, right? That's an education component. Uh, building the current process, when I, when I say that, implies, okay, are we using the test driven development from the start, right? every delivery to be, should be tested. And those tests should include security testing. So some common tech, uh, security testing, such as you know, code quality, now occurs so frequently, like you know, it's no longer considered as a separate security practice in itself, right? Uh, so it's merely, it should be merely part of the routine, part of the development, right? So we, you know, in our organizations, we are, again, you know, to Tyler's point, it doesn't mean we're doing it you know, uh, the most efficient way, but we're trying to get there, right? Uh, applying that security practice by in integrating security pro uh, processes and tools in the DevOps uh, cycle. If you look at the software development lifecycle processes, it is continuous everything. So it's not like one stage, right? Meaning that you have to enable end-to-end -end delivery to support the natural progression of the work to achieve that DevSecOps speed, where you know, so embedding security across the entire value chain, right? So. So successful, you know, DevSecOps, in my opinion, you know, definitely hinges on understanding and thoughtfully integrating security into the development process. So 
our model is, uh, you know, to review each stage, recommend what security controls to integrate for. So as an example, in the continuous planning, hey, architects and agile teams need to integrate their execution plans across the enterprise on an ongoing basis, right, where privacy requirements management, threat modeling to view the application through the lens of a potential attacker, right? Continuous development stage where um, you're uh, collaborating, you know, planning the delivery of those small frequent changes, IDE, you know, security plugins, pre-commit hooks for lightweight static analysis, uh, you know, checking with an integrated you know, development environments, peer reviews, secure coding standards to identify effectively what those code, you know, uh, what those pre-review processes and uh, pre-commit hook uh, tasks look like, right? Continuous integration, right? Uh, where you're integrating the changes, where you know you're, the developers are, um, you know, creating, managing, and sharing their code in repositories such as you know GitHub or Azure repos. There's a risk here that that can lead to vulnerabilities or unintentionally including credentials or tokens, right, in commits. So how do you how do you scan that? How do you make sure that the repository scanning is enabled? Those capabilities are uh, in there. Now with GitHub Advanced Security you can look at those vulnerabilities for credentials or credentials change or any flag for any remediation. OSS vulnerability scanning also is there. And then I can go and on and on, right? Depends on the management, OWASP depends on uh, dependency checks, right? Continuous testing, shift left model, right? Automatically test changes, app security testing, unit testing, infra testing, and then deployment. Delivery, like many other organizations, we use build and release pipelines to automate and standardize the processes. Uh, release pipeline should have all those capabilities embedded right, through the testing environments and to the production. And then, and then finally, I think you know what's most important for all of us to take is like you know how do we create that culture of learning and curiosity, right? That emphasizes the importance of security. Super, super important, right? You know we need to have the people uh, have that curiosity so that everyone is really, really focused on. Hey, we discover anything, you know, it goes wrong, um, and then you know having security, we can kind of eliminate that. And so diving a little bit deeper as well, especially Lucia, with the mm -hmm. rise in like requirements around software bill of materials and some of the compliance requirements around that, how is that uh, impacting your work or, or changing your focus at Mercado Libre? Okay. So I have like a little bit of a reflection about this, about everything BJ and Tyler says, said. So I think that regulations, many types of regulations, gives us like a chance, like opportunity to prove the value of security in each stage of the development life cycle. Because with regulations, security strategies are required, we, ha we must have them. And this brings us like a really challenging question, at least in my opinion, that how do we measure that? How do we measure the value that security in early stages, like BJ said, uh, adds you know, um, because yeah, yeah, as we just said, the earlier we catch a bug, uh, design flow, uh, security issues, whatever, the easier and the faster it solves, it solves it. But that's it. <laughs> Is the company willing to, to spend like loads of lots of money just to reduce the time a developer uh, is spending on fixing something that's something in production, it's a vulnerability. Maybe the answer is yes, I don't know. Usually it's no. Usually there are like more factors in the equation, you know. Just It's not just time, uh, it's also money, maybe. You know, uh, I detected an uh, insecure uh, uh, deserialization issue in a pull request review, and so that means that I saved the company this exact amount of money that it will cost in a vacancy problem. No, no, that's, it's not that straightforward. And, that's why it's really challenging. How do we measure that? I could go on and on, on you know, uh, money, time, uh, image, and, and the reputation of the company and regulations, of course. There are so many factors to take into account, and it's such a challenging task that team, security teams must be up, up to because uh, this is our chance. You know, security is something more people, it's talking about, and as we said, more developers, I'm a developer myself, so more developers are really curious about security. So I think it's key to prove the value, not, not just important, you know, we know it's important to have security. We know uh, Mercado Libre also has like a FinTech part, it's Mercado Pau, and I use it. So I know it's important because it's my money, <laughs> but how do we measure this value we are giving to, to the company? That's I love the that. kind of motivation. Thank you. 
And actually, that's a really nice segue into the next section. So Brittany, I want to hand it over to you to talk a little bit or perhaps ask some questions about developer productivity, because it sounds like what you're saying, Lucia, is not only do we need to make sure we're providing security, but we need to do so in a way that doesn't inhibit the business from pursuing its you know, financial and other uh, objectives that it's trying to accomplish. Absolutely. And I think for so long, it's felt like those two metrics were at war with themselves, like meeting compliance standards and being productive have never felt like in sync and like they're empowering one each other. But I think we're getting to a way where we're starting to hold tools or solutions we use to a higher standard, a standard in which we feel that they need to help us with our velocity. And we know in today's current macroeconomic climate where we're all being pushed to do more with less essentially, that it's so important that we use solutions that actually help maximize uh, developer productivity and maximize the value we can bring to market, but harder said than done. So I'm super excited for Lucia to get your perspective as a developer, how you have prioritized the developer experience in your organization as it relates to security. Okay, so to answer this question, I'll give you kind of a context. So in Mercado Libre, we started uh, working with CoQL back in 2020, uh, when LTTM was the, the product, not GitHub and security. Uh, first of all, because it solves our multiple technologies problem. Uh, CoQL supported Python, Java, and JavaScript, and Go was a work in progress. So we used CoQL to analyze the uh, pull request and to block when any vulnerability is found. But the only information we gave the developers was, OK, this line of code is vulnerable. Fix it. And that's it. <laughs> so we have a lot of problems about that, of course. And GitHub and security have given us a big improvement on the developer experience. You know, the, the vulnerability review reduced the amount of time wasted by developers and also by security engineers. All the information to understand the vulnerability is right there. You know, with useful links and also the, the, the path view, you can see the way the user input flows through a, a source function to a sync function. You know, all the information is there. Developers used to have uh, so much trouble understanding their applications flow because some, sometimes it's really tricky. Sometimes applications are big, sometimes you're new, whatever. So I think this view is key to reducing wasting time for us. And as I said before, also for the security team, not just for developers. I'm a developer myself, so I really enjoy this view. But when a developer has a question, there is a security team member chatting, uh, meeting with them, helping them, whatever. And also, uh, sometimes when we think we understand them, something, but we don't understand it, uh, some trouble happens. You know, a static analysis has false positives, something like it's theoretical. It's theoretical. Uh, we, we can't do anything about it. We create our question queries. We try to improve them, but yeah, false positives are there. But we also have like a lot a lot of wrongly reported false positives uh, because what I said before, we just said, okay, here you go. There's a vulnerability, fix it, deal with it, whatever. So we continue measuring this because we're still migrating to GitHub and security, but we really hope that GitHub and security will reduce the amount of real vulnerabilities reported and false positives. And I think this is important because it's not just the developer time, that is really important, but it's also the security team time best of the world with GitHub and security. Yeah, absolutely. Anywhere we can maximize both teams' value and help them to work together is so powerful. Uh, Tyler, any thoughts from your organization on how you've challenged this? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think like, yeah, I have to remind myself. So we, we've only been in GitHub here officially since last June, we completed a migration of 37,000 repositories into GitHub Enterprise Cloud. And um, prior to that, we weren't doing any kind of holistic dependency scanning or secret scanning across Liberty Mutual, um, which again, is kind of hard to believe. And it feels like, you know, these things have been institutionalized at Liberty for quite a while now, even though it hasn't been too much time. And, but, you know, prior to that, again, teams were sort of left 
to their own devices. If they were doing those sorts of things at all, we would have little pockets here and there of you know various tools that an engineering team would identify and and bring in house. And maybe it worked great, maybe it didn't, but there wasn't a lot of sharing going on. There wasn't a lot of convergence and and standardization. And so I think like a huge advantage of you know moving into GitHub was on day one, we turned dependency scanning via dependent bot and secret scanning on holistically on behalf of all repositories in Liberty Mutual. And we're enforcing that setting. And so, you know, we're getting some insights that we haven't had historically. So just being able to go in and get an understanding of what our posture is across these two super important areas has been a huge win. And then getting that feedback again, as early in that engineering experience as possible is another one. Um, you know, some other things that we've done historically in the past is, you know, if some kind of security vulnerability manifests or, you know, there's sort of some kind of compliance rule that we're enforcing, it happens like way downstream post deployment, you know, engineers are getting their app remediated or they're getting slapped on the wrist by security, but it's like way downstream. And so what's been awesome is, not only do we have these, these new features and capabilities, but we're also getting that feedback really early in that engineering life cycle. So we're identifying these things, you know, at commit during, you know, the commit check and PR process and starting to build that awareness and that, that culture across the development community at, as early in that cycle as possible. Uh, and so the efficiencies gain there, right? Like you think of, you know, what it meant historically, and, and this is still happening now, right? But what it meant historically where I'm an engineer, I deploy an app, oh, whoops, there was some sort of vulnerability or some compliance thing I didn't do. And post deployment, that app gets remediated, stopped, shut down something. And the engineer's like, whoa, wait, what happened? My deploy passed, my build passed, my app got stopped. Like, and so the amount of waste and churn that would happen through that experience was, was really bad. And so now we're, we're letting the engineer about, you know, these sorts of vulnerabilities or, or compliance misses when they're committing their change during that pull request experience. And so that, you know, you talk about productivity and time savings and things like that. And I think that's a really great example mm -hmm. of it. Um, and so, yeah, it's been interesting, you know, we're, we're on the journey here. It's not perfect. We have a lot of work to do, but I like everything folks are saying about, you know, to me, it's about culture and, and community and, you know, getting engineers passionate about, you know, securing their supply chain, securing that, um, you know, pipeline ecosystem. And, um, you know, we're, 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 we're getting there. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's what we're really passionate about. That's what I'm passionate about is to be in a spot where we're not having to remediate things because, you know, engineers are thinking about this stuff and educated on on how to build software securely from the jump. Absolutely. And I think you highlighted something that's so uh, unseen sometimes in culture, but having that transparency early can create a culture of trust and transparency where someone doesn't feel blindsided and how that empowers them mm -hmm. to be a partner rather than to be a detractor from the experience. BJ, how has this mirrored your experience? Have you had different techniques or a similar experience? Yeah, I think the experiences are pretty common, right? Across, you know, especially given that we are, um, uh, you know, trying to develop a culture, you know, around, you know, how we can secure everything. So, um, uh, you know, to what uh, Tyler said, hey, what's the rework it's causing for the organization when you bring, you know, security far into the life cycle, right? So in my leadership role at JM Family, my focus is to reduce that cognitive load on the developer teams by providing some self-service tools, capabilities, and processes. And I need to provide a developer experience that is demonstrably better than, hey, do it yourself approach, right? So that's kind of what it is. Um, so in collaboration with my extended partners in the organization from architecture, you know, technology platform, agile product, infosec teams, like I am taking an approach of DevSecOps as a product. So which is what I'm calling here to improve all facets of developer experience that are affected by highly uh, high friction development tools, technologies and processes, right? So empowering those development teams by using uh, DevSecOps as a product approach that focuses on 
delivering product features and the, let the developers use those features as needed through a self-service platform. So that's my aspirational state in, you know, in the organization. So these features will span the entire software delivery site uh, uh, and delivery lifecycle, meaning development frameworks, code and artifact repositories, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipelines, like with integrated actions and automations, security architecture by design, right? Test automation frameworks, uh, execution environments, that includes the cloud services, container platforms, as we move towards the cloud native, of course. And then, you know, to earlier's, you know, Tyler's point, observability tools to support those application operations. And then, of course, change management, auditing, et cetera, for regular uh, and uh, self-operating as possible, right? So what this means is like, you know, now what I have identified is I'm still putting this together as, hey, there's a new need for tool standardization and integration, meaning backlog management, source code, artifact repository, scans, environments to enable and, um, you know, automate our accountabilities. There's also a need uh, to create and adopt enterprise pipelines, like standards, like with blueprints, and patterns to automate the compliance and end-to-end, -end, uh, you know, SDLC while reducing friction within the technology teams. Right? There is also an opportunity, you know, for teams to understand owner, understand the ownership and accountability of the end-to-end, -end, you know, delivery. Meaning, you know, how are they accountable? And you know, they need to own the compliance, security, and costs. Right? And that's associated with that. There's an opportunity to consolidate automation frameworks such as testing automation, so th th that way we can reduce the maintenance of costs. So, so of course, you know, nothing can be done without collaboration. You know, at communication, knowledge sharing tools, right? So we selected the GitHub Advanced Security in an effort to create that consistent developer experience, which you're talking about, you know, Brittany, because there is, uh, you know, um, it does meet our needs of having a fully integrated DevSecOps platform for collaboration and inner sourcing, right? That's important. Automation and development and providing the security by design. Also, you know, we're also evaluating the GitHub Copilot to synthesize the AI pair programming experience as well. Uh, I know that's a hot topic right now. So, but let's not forget right now that a good developer experience should definitely focus on reducing the frustration and friction for developers and other teams, right? By reducing unnecessary cognitive load that I was alluding to, right? A good developer you know, experience increases the satisfaction and capacity to deliver value. And then finally, a good developer experience also extends our processes, leadership and management of the organization to be more effective. I love that take, VJ. Yeah. And mm -hmm. just talking about the way in which security can can be a leader in helping you be more productive. So I see that we've got a ton of great questions here, and we do have some time for Q and A. So I want to make sure we jump to that really quick. If any of you that are watching want to learn a little bit more about GitHub Advanced Security for yourselves, you can always click the "Book a Meeting" button up at the top, um, where you can book a meeting with some of the folks here at GitHub, and we're more than happy to have a conversation with you about how we can help your organization accomplish the same things. That said, also if if you would like to ask a question, there's a Q&A section along the top right of the chat where you can go ahead and ask your question. We'll be uh, reading them off or, or going through them uh, by the number of upvotes. So be sure to vote the ones that you like. Um, so as a, a general question, but I think that maybe this is a good one, Lucia, for you to start in on and then we can go around. Um, they mentioned that the first poll is missing a core challenge, which is around test coverage for developers. Um, now, when it comes to you know helping those developers automate dependency up updates or security updates, um, what are some of the ways in which your organization helps those teams effectively you know, make strides in solving those security vulnerabilities that are being found? Um, I will just say as a brief caveat, some of the cool stuff coming in Copilot X can actually help you like write really neat tests on this space. So just like a little bit of a minor plug there um, on, on solving that problem. But I'd love to get uh, maybe this group's take starting with you, Lucia. Yeah, I had like a little preview about a couple of uh, new stuff, new features, but the guy that's in GitHub and really, really exciting. So I think that's... This question like uh, touches different things that we, we already covered in the panel. That, but I think that the, more, the most important is uh, the awareness of the communication, you know? Uh, as I said before, we have like a whole team that focuses on that, focuses on, on capacitations, on maybe meetings, on uh, lectures, whatever. So f the first part, we, we try to report everything the most clear and simpler as possible. You know, like 
well, we did have security, as I said before, it was really, really clear. Uh, also, we, we had dependencies, we tried to to report it as soon as possible. And sometimes we, we, we try to be less strict because what you said before, we, we are not like the backup of the organization that we're going to to uh, punish them because they had vulnerable dependencies, oh my God. Um, so we try to report it the clear as possible and then to give them the tools to understand how to uh, solve this with GitHub and security, it's, um, it's kind of easier uh, because you have like the whole explanation of the vulnerability and we have our own um, courses about each different vulnerability and we have like a, our own top 10, it's not the always top 10, it's the mainly top 10. So uh, we really customize it to our needs and to our uh, environment. So it's easier to take these things you um, to, you you learn about the vulnerability, like general things, and then fix it in your code. The same uh, with, develop, with vulnerable dependencies. Uh, sometimes it's not that uh, simple to understand where is the dependency with transitive and transitive and transitive dependencies. Uh, the guys uh, working with Node or JavaScript know what I'm talking about. You, you, you get, could have like a really big tree of dependencies uh, actually, a, a graph in Node because, well, I, I, I won't go into that. It's too technical for this, but it could be a nightmare. So we're trying to to give them tools and also to to work with them to help them. Maybe having a meeting or whatever. I don't. I know that as I said before, it does it does not scale, but sometimes it's it's the way it's the best way to to have like this. Face to face, you know, because it's virtual, but kind of face to face experience. That's great. And maybe Tyler or, or VJ, do you have additional thoughts around that in terms of, uh, you know, the test coverage piece and how you can continue to allow for like developer velocity to to not be impeded by security? Yeah, I, I don't know that I could do a better job than than Lucia just did. I think she answered it perfectly, but. Um, you know, really just trying to position ourselves with regards to the engineering community at Liberty as, as partners. You know, we're not here to be big brother and looking over folks' shoulders and, and slapping them on the wrist if they if they make a mistake, right? Like that's not the idea here. We're, we're here to help. Um, we're here to educate and, and collaborate first and foremost. Um, and then through some of that, bring efficiencies to that engineering experience um, which we think you know together will manifest in in better security overall um, and so uh, you know we're definitely leveraging some of the observability that we get for free out of github advanced security as a result of turning it on in the first place to understand our current state you know it's hard to make improvements if you don't even understand what like current state looks like so that baseline was super important and like Lucia said, we, we've been, you know, using that baseline made the rounds, right? So whether we're talking about, you know, Keith, you mentioned code coverage, or we're talking about, you know, volume of dependency vulnerabilities or, or secret scanning alerts, right? We're looking at that baseline and then we're going around and, and about, you know, across the communities and doing the lunch and learns, doing the round tables, doing the shares to talk about that current state and, and to sort of gain alignment on, you know, where it makes sense as an enterprise to focus. And based on that, you know, we're prioritizing features in, in the backlog and we do have a secure development experience team that's dedicated to, to just this problem or opportunity space. And based on what we're seeing from a, from a data perspective, based on the feedback that we're getting from the community, we're partnering with the community to start to solve those problems. Um, but but the, the operative word here is, is partnership, right? And so, I think through that partnership, through you know some real effort towards education and, and collaboration and communication, I think we start to build trust. And through that trust, we can start to build the culture that that we're after here. And um, you know, again, that's what it's all about. It, it doesn't happen overnight, I guess, is maybe the challenging part. You know, it's not like we're looking at um, our reports, you know, our dependency graphs or, you know, things like that and saying, wow, look at these numbers, you know, diving down to next to not like that's not the case. You know, it's not going to necessarily turn on a dime 
overnight, but um, it, I feel like we're really headed in the right direction. And I think, you know, we have the most important piece well underway, which is starting to build that culture and, and that community. And I think with that, given the right focus, you know, we're going to really be able to make some tangible progress towards whatever thing we identify as being the, the priority. I hear a little bit of um, what Jez Humble, uh, one of the authors from the DevOps handbook, he says, DevOps is just communication, coordination, and collaboration. And so I, I hear that coming out of what you're saying, Tyler. Vijay, would you like to add any additional thoughts on this before we jump into the next question? No, you know, no additional thoughts. I think, you know, Lucy and Tyler summed it up really well, right? I think it starts with the uh, mindset. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it's a cultural mindset. It's a cultural shift. Uh, as leaders, I, uh, you know, I believe we are all trying to do the right things. And uh, I can certainly you know, learn from what Tyler and Lucia had shared and, you know, use that as needed in my organization. Likewise, I think, you know, we can, you, you know, the people who are listening to us can, you know, leverage some of the best practices we are trying to bring across our organization so that we are creating that end-to-end -end developer experience. Remember, right, you know, developer and developer-centric approach is the best way to do it. And if you kind of put yourself in the issues and think backwards, right, you know, it, it, it'll all becomes, uh, it, it becomes very, um, you know, tied back to the culture that we're trying to promote. Absolutely. And I think we've touched on this a little bit for the next question, but I think it's really important um, to frame it in the way that Justin has as well as a new DevSecOps engineer. What would your guys' thoughts be around on strategies a new DevSecOps engineer could use to bring awareness to dev teams, help build that relationship with dev teams, and help them ultimately care about security as another metric of quality? BJ, we'll start with you. Yeah, you know, thank you, Justin, for that question. Um, I'm living that, you know, uh, today, right? I, I think it's important to also not um, delineate or separate yourselves from a developer to a DevSecOps engineer. I, it, it's again, you know, it's a mindset. Like, yeah, you are going to be that champion of security that is going to enforce and set that clear direction and also have a supporting landscape, uh, you know, which means, hey, you need to be in front of the funnel, uh, be the leader to securely, you know, provide that vision to securely deliver and run software. Uh, where are the opportunities to minimize the tool chain set? Where, you know, how can you provide those traceability of artists, right? I think, um, so that's kind of some of the, I would start with that strategy, right? Uh, document the, you know, supply chain or the development progress by creating a chain of custody, starting from code creation to build, to test, to package, and, you know, going through the development, right? Uh, I would also encourage you to adopt a security framework, like uh, such as SALSA, right? Uh, that stands for, I believe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, Tyler or Lucy, has supply chain, I mean, supply chain levels for software artifacts, I guess. Again, <laughs> I could be wrong here, but uh, which means basically, you know, that that framework will provide a checklist of standards and controls to prevent, hey, tampering. You know, how do you improve integrity? Uh, how do you secure those packages and what uh, in the infrastructure of your, uh, how do you ma manage the infrastructure in your project, right? So uh, what this means is that that framework, you know, providing the framework upfront, you know, will, will also, you know, help the developers to understand, hey, you know, here's what a secure end-to-end -end software delivery means, right? Controls to safeguard those vulnerabilities from vulnerabilities, I would say both internal as well as external sources. Requirements for security and isolation of environments. How do you build them, right? Uh, and then how do you, what is the ability to validate the um, authenticity in the source of any executed bin binaries, as an example? Uh, securing the underlying infrastructure as well, right? Uh, don't forget about the tools and processes, right? So there's an ongoing visibility into that uh, continuous compliance model. And finally, I mean, you know, um, you know, Justin, what I would advise you is, adopt the best practices, industry practices for managing the security of the tools, you know, so that they can manage it themselves. So be the champion, right? You know, be the champion, work with the you know, developers and uh, let them be like you eventually. So that's the, that's the recipe for success, I would say. Yeah, thank you for that perspective. Tyler, anything to add there? I don't, I don't think so. I think BJ nailed it. You know, I think, you know, from my perspective, I try to just be a good listener, you know, on top of all the things BJ said, and, you know, I just try to build some of those partnerships and, and go out into the community and have conversations with big and small groups of engineers and, and listen and, and talk about the opportunities that we're seeing and make sure that resonates 
with them and, and listen for feedback and listen for their ideas on, on how we can make things better. And, uh, you know, through that, we're kind of in it together, right? It's not me telling people how it's going to be, right? And there might be a little bit of that just from a compliance and regulatory perspective, certainly. But, you know, even in those cases, it's explaining why, you know, and making sure people know um, why we're doing these. If we want to continue to sell insurance and, and do what we do, you know, these things are necessary. And then, you know, for some of the other things, um, yeah, just make it clear that we're in it together. You know, we're, we're, we're after the same problems. Ultimately, we want to deliver value to our users and our business. And, um, you know, the only way we can do it is through a really strong partnership. So that's it. Awesome. Awesome. Lucia, any, any final thoughts from you before um, we get ready to wrap it up here? Yeah, just one little thought. Um, one of my strategies, at least, is to make myself clear that security is like efficiency. You know, you're a better developer if you can code securely. You know, you, your code is secure. If your code does what you want, what you intended to do, you know, because that, that that's what security is about. You know, an attacker finding a way to do something with your code that you didn't uh, prevent, you didn't thought. So I think that's a great idea. I mean, that's something that uh, I apply to myself and to developers in the company. Security, uh, it's like a new feature for you to be a better developer, a better professional. I love it. I love it. That's such a great way to think of it. Brittany, do you have any parting thoughts before we uh, share some of the links here for feedback? No, I just want to thank everybody for joining and being so engaged in the chat and a big special thanks to our panelists. I know your insights today were so critical and helpful to many here. So thank you everyone for joining and we'll get up the schedule of events for keep the talk through and also we'd love your feedback. So we'll chat through that. Yeah, absolutely. So once again, as well, you know, from my side, thank you, uh, especially to our panelists and all of you in the audience who have joined us today to have a great conversation. Up next at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific, we have the Scale Your Security Team with a global community of security researchers. Uh, I'm personally really excited for this talk. A couple of my colleagues are involved in that. Uh, so definitely check that out. And of course, there is a link in the chat. But if you're afraid of clicking on links, we have a QR code for you to take a picture of and uh, give us some feedback on the session so that we can understand how we did and uh, can continue to give you this kind of content if you enjoyed it. Uh, so with that, as I always like to say, remember to get commit and stay classy. Thank you folks for joining us again. And I will see you or many of us will see you at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Cheers, everyone.